Porter Halliburton interview, take one. Hi. <laughs> Good morning. We finally got here. Right. <laughs> I'm going to have these headphones on. Don't mind them. Just... I will not pay no attention okay, to them. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you okay, sir? I hear your bracelets. First of all, uh, one thing is that in the, the final interview, actually, I'm going to tweet. In the final edit, my voice won't be part of it. Right. Um, so if there's a particular question, like I say, Porter, what does freedom mean to you? Uh -huh. Try to repeat the question in the sense to say, freedom means okay otherwise if you just say it means then yeah i see yeah gotcha. and if if you forget to do that and i feel like it's important i might remind you but other than that don't worry about okay it. Yeah. i can do yeah. a lot with recording right um so uh initially what i want to say is that i mean i think with you in particular porter you're a very developed human being. A, you're thoughtful. You think about um, your past, your history. You have values that uh, animate those thoughts mm -hmm. and that are the guidelines of those thoughts. Let's say so. Um, as much as possible for us, this is a conversation. Yeah. Forget the cameras. Forget the lights. All that stuff. And and I think. The potential here is that this conversation is a we're here to serve those that will come after us. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, this conversation, I hope, is a kind of prayer right. that you and I are sharing sure. about your experience. Yes. Thank you, sir. And lastly, I want to say thank you for mm. your service to all of us, to your nation, to your country. And to those individuals you've touched again and again and again. Really Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so as you and I briefly touched on uh, what you have been interviewed many times, you've given many, many uh, uh, talks, uh, certainly at your time at the Naval War College. You served uh, those in the military who could learn from your experience. And what makes this project different from a lot of the sort of civil uh, documentaries and stuff, uh, which honestly for me, I found they, they come almost at times from a place of voyeurism, like well, what happened to you in the torture right. and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I don't, the torture is a huge and horrifying part of your story, but what sets you apart, all of you men, is not the fact that you were tortured. There were men and mm -hmm. women what sets you apart is the way you met the adversity of your conditions, the way you bonded together, and the way you found yourselves on the other side of failure, on the other side of heartbreak, on the other side of pain. Right. And you form something that you all hold to this day. I find it in every one of you. Mm -hmm. So um, this project is for leadership, ethical training. One could say that the role of defense is to protect us from the dangers without. The role of honor, ethics, the core of our values is what protects us from the dangers within. Right. And I know you know what that means. Yeah. So that we hope to explore that in the mm -hmm. answer. All right. Um, so to, to begin with, if you could, kind of sketch a kind of brief chronology of your shoot down about, I mean, I know that, um, you know, for instance, touch on the fact that you were presumed KIA, and in fact, there is a, a headstone in your backyard, mm -hmm. where, um, and that we'll film later. Um, right, yeah. Be real day. But if you could, a, a sort of cr brief chronology and overview. So I always have storyline points that I can mm -hmm. of what you, what happened to you. 
Well, I guess it all really began in college when oh, I... I'm sorry, one last thing is if you could state your name and your uh, rank at retirement, et cetera. Oh, okay. So, yeah. uh, Porter Halliburton, uh, Commander, United States Navy, retired. And I guess all this began when I was in college and uh, was a senior and was faced with a decision of uh, to be drafted you know, to Vietnam and all of that, or to maybe take another path. And uh, since I had avoided uh, ROTC because of my JROTC uh, in high school at Military Academy, I didn't have to take ROTC, and so I was not going to be commissioned at the end of graduation like most of my friends. And so. I made a decision to um, enlist in the Navy and sign up for aviation program, and I did. And uh, after graduation in October, I went down, 63, I went down to Pensacola for Naval Pre-Flight School. Went through that, went through training. Marty uh, Duerson and I got married uh, during that time, and um, at the uh, final, uh, Part of my training, which is the RAG, the Replacement Air Group, in Key West, Florida, VF-101, um, I completed that and then uh, received orders uh, to go to VF-84 uh, aboard the um, USS Independence in Norfolk, Virginia. And I volunteered for that, knowing that they were going to Vietnam shortly because I thought, well, Hell, I've been trained to do this, we might as well go, go and do it. And uh, pretty naive about the war and everything. Uh, Marty was uh, eight months pregnant at the time and I moved her from Key West up to Miami and uh, left to go to, to Oceana and meet my squadron. And I stopped in Davidson to visit my mother and grandparents, um, and, and at that time I got a call from Marty saying, I think the baby's coming, prematurely. <laughs> so I got emergency leave, went back, and uh, got there just after my daughter Dabney was born, and I got to see her and be with Dabney and, and Marty for five days, and then I went back up to Norfolk and so that was in, uh, in April. Uh, she was born on April 13th, and so on a month later, May, May the 12th, we departed for Vietnam. So we got over there in the summertime, and uh, we started operations. We flew on what was called Dixie Station, which was off of South Vietnam, and we would fly missions under the control of Air Force uh, forward air controllers, and it was kind of just warm up for more serious stuff up north, and we did that for a few days a week or something, and then moved up to Yankee Station, and there we were flying missions uh, as part of Rolling Thunder against uh, North Vietnam. And basically the mission was to stop the flow of s supplies and personnel from China, from Russia, other Soviet bloc countries into Hanoi and from there down to, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail into South Vietnam to support the Viet Cong. That was our primary mission. And so we flew lots of different kinds of missions, uh, tar cap, bar cap, and all kinds of things. We dropped bombs and, and uh, napalm and uh, just about everything. And uh, in addition to our primary mission, which was uh, air defense, air to air defense. We were there to engage and defeat MiGs if they came up and threatened, uh, threatened our fleet or our, our other aircraft. And I flew about uh, 75 missions. I mostly flew with Lieutenant Commander Stan Olmsted, who was, I thought, the best pilot in the squadron. And I was very lucky to be paired with him mostly because uh, he taught me so much about aviation, and I was a, an RAO, radar intercept offer, operator. And so um, most of the missions that we flew, I felt were fairly insignificant 
uh, we didn't do much. We, we bombed some things, you know, we blew up some little bridges, but the major targets were off limits. And um, so we couldn't bomb the MiGs that were sitting in the airfields at Kep and other places. Uh, we just had to pass them by. And they didn't come up to fight, so we never engaged uh, MiGs, which was what I guess we really wanted to do. And um, so in October, uh, we went to Japan for R&R. &R. We came back. I think we flew one mission, and then we got the word that we were going to fly a Alpha Strike against one of those targets that had been off limits. And so we briefed for that. It was to bomb the bridge at Taiwing, which is a, a major industrial city between Hanoi and China and roads and rail come through there and there's a big river so there was a bridge and we were to take that bridge out. And it was the, uh, the biggest alpha strike of the war up to that time. And I thought, well, finally we're doing something that w might really make a difference. Because we hadn't seen any trucks, you know, to, to destroy. We hadn't destroyed anything really that made much difference. And so this was a big deal. There were about 30 airplanes from our, our carrier. There was another carrier involved uh, as well. The Air Force was uh, bombing or uh, going to attack some SAM sites from, from Thailand and so on. And so I, we were pretty excited about it. And uh, we did not plan the flight because the A6s had the best uh, navigation equipment. We had very primitive navigation equipment, except for TACAN. And um, so they planned the flight, and we, uh, we flew in under 3,000 feet because the SAM-2 missiles at the time uh, did not operate below 3,000 feet. But it put us right in the envelope for anti-aircraft fire, which was the flaw in the plan. And so uh, we flew in uh, around Haiphong and uh, then flew towards the target. And as, uh, as we uh, were approaching a turning point, which was a karst ridge, uh, I said to Stan, uh, we're coming up on our turning point, 10 degrees uh, to, to, uh, to port. And uh, he said, Roger. And about that time, I looked off to, to the right and I saw these puffs of anti-aircraft fire coming. And they were coming so fast that before I could even say anything to Stan, uh, boom, we took a hit. And uh, I'm sure I was in a little bit of shock because I didn't really know what had happened. It just, there was a big thump and so on. And I guess after a second or two, the, um, I, I said there were papers flying around in the cockpit. I saw there were holes in the canopy. I looked up uh, around the console and I saw Stan's head uh, without a helmet on it, kind of lolling around. And uh, I started to broadcast on our radio through the mic in my uh, oxygen mask and the oxygen mask was gone, blown away. And I saw that we were still flying straight and level, but we were very low level, and I knew we were going to hit something very quickly. And I had no, uh, you know, I, I think there was a, a very, very brief moment. Do I just ride this thing in rather than be a POW? And then, you know, I came to my senses and I said, I can't do that, you know, I've got to try to survive. So I reached up to punch out and I, there was a bunch of twisted metal up on top of the, the seat and I, I looked it down and it was um, my kneeboard, my aluminum kneeboard had been blown off, twisted up and everything. And then I looked down and there was a big piece of metal sticking out of my hand through the glove. And so I used the other ejection handle and uh, and ejected at very low level, and I uh, heard gunshots. Uh, 
could hear the bullets whizzing through the canopy and so on. And I was not in the chute for very long. I landed, I got rid of all my gear. I got my survival radio out and uh, began broadcasting, you know, that I was down and okay and all of that. And then I uh, started to run uh, away from where I, I knew the uh, shots were coming from, which is a village about a mile away. And uh, I started to run and uh, I had gotten rid of most of my gear except for the vest. And uh, I very quickly ran out of water. Uh, my, my mouth was just cotton and I didn't, I didn't carry any water, which was stupid. But uh, so I had to stop and um, I looked for the most cover that there was. And there was a, a, a bunch of bushes there and I started running for that. And a big snake jumped up right in front of me and he headed for the bushes too. So I let him have that bush. <laughs> and I chose another one that was not quite as big or as concealing. Now, all of this was just kind of low scrub stuff anyway. And uh, again, I'm on my radio trying to contact somebody, not getting any uh, response at all. And uh, pretty soon I heard the Vietnamese coming. The villagers uh, eventually, they saw me, they knew where I was, and uh, I knew they were around me. And then this dog comes up and looks at me, and I thought he's going to start barking and everything, but he didn't. He just stood there and looked at me and uh, so on. And as, the, uh, as I knew that I was going to be captured, um, I took my survival radio, which was connected to a battery with a cord, and I took my survival knife and I cut that cord. And that was when I knew I was truly alone. And then I smashed up the radio with uh, with the knife because I knew that uh, we knew that the the Vietnamese would use these radios to uh, to try to lure in rescue helicopters and Sandys and so on. So I didn't want that to happen. But that was kind of a you know I said I'm I'm really I'm here now. You know there's e even if the rescue helo comes in, I got no way of contacting them. How long ago was that? And uh, that was, uh, I think I was captured in about 20 minutes. And they, uh, first thing they did is they cut my boots off, they cut the laces and took my boots off because they didn't want me to be able to run away or try to escape or something. They tied my hands behind my back and um, marched to the village and uh, on the way, the, the strike aircraft came back the same path that we had taken in. And I could hear the anti-aircraft fire going like crazy. And in fact, they shot down two more airplanes. And they had hit one other one when, I was, when we were shot down. So that was a stupid thing to do, to come out the same way you came in because then they were lying in wait. So two other, two other airplanes were shot down. Four, four of us were captured on the same day, the same mission. The biggest loss uh, of the war for the Navy. And how many years ago was it? When was, did this happen? This happened on October 17th, 53 years ago, today. <laughs> yeah. So I exchanged emails with the other three guys, as we always do on, on this day, that uh, just to commemorate the fact that, you know, it's been a long time, but we're still here. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make a slight adjustment of the camera. I'm feeling the breeze. Is the air conditioning off? She said they turned it off. You don't hear it, but you feel the breeze all the time. Yeah. I mean, it may not be. I'm gonna put your water, so it's probably difficult for you to get, but I'll, I'll be out of my shot. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. 53 years ago today, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, 
rather than going into the history of the various prison cells that you were in and, and mm -hmm. at this time, let's let's begin with um, you left the world behind of technology. Of I mean, you were on a carrier. At, after your raise and missions, you would go back to the officers' quarters, and there was a and suddenly you were in an incredibly primitive world. Right. Talk to me about that thing itself. It's, as one, yeah. as, as one, I think it was Paul Galanti said, it, when he was shot down for the first time, he realized he never had any no, notion of how Vietnam smelled. Suddenly mm -hmm. he could smell the smell of this. Talk to me a little bit about that transition. Well, I. I the whole, the instant that we were hit, and I knew that Stan was probably dead, that was just an almost indescribable feeling, you know, that here uh, we have done this 75 times. We've come and we've flown through incredible flak, and at night you see tracers and all this stuff. And we must be living right because we've been flying right through it, you know, and never picked up a scratch. And you go back to the carrier and uh, have a hot meal and a good night's sleep. And, you know, and then you get up and you do it again. And it just seemed like that was the routine where it, that's the way it's going to be. And I think I had thought about um, maybe being shot down and killed. I mean, that's always, you know, when you fly an airplane, that's a, always a danger. I never seriously considered being a POW. And all of a sudden, I knew I was going to be. And I knew it was going to be bad. And uh, it was like a big knife had come down and just cut every, every connection I had with the world that I had known and I was on the other side now. And I knew it was gonna be different. And I didn't know if I'd survive. I just knew I was gonna try, and if I couldn't make it, maybe I could commit suicide somehow and whatever, but I said, I'm gonna try. And what, what was the first thing that you can recall that motivated that, that I'm gonna try? Was it thinking about Marty and your daughter, or Well, I, as I said, I thought about, just for a second, about do I just ride the plane in? Stan is there, let's go in together, you know, and avoid all of that. And, and I think it was the, the, the thought of my family, you know, particularly Marty and my newborn child and so on. And I had gotten, we had exchanged tapes and so on, and so I, I knew something about, you know, her six months of life and <laughs> so on. And I just said, I've got to try. i got to try to survive this and get back to them. Okay, good. Yeah. So I'm sure that that first little germ, I mean, that little molecule of decision, I'm sure, grew and matured and became many, many things over time. Well, it did, yes. And we'll try to, we'll try to touch on that. Mm -hmm. um, so, as Charlie Plum said to me, Patrick, one of the things you need to understand is we were the first failed warriors of the first failed war. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, an empirical judgment. That was just how he felt that he shared a sentiment with uh, your the fellow POWs that, that America had gone into Vietnam with a John Wayne mentality. We could take any torture, we could survive, we would always triumph. And with our technical superiority, we assumed a lot of things. And every former POW I talked to describes the same thing you did, that coming down in that chute, the small arms fire, the touching ground, and the world changes. And some of them have even said as they were floating down, they could hear this pop, 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 mm -hmm. and they would realize it was small arms fire. And as Charlie said, there was a part of him in that moment that looked down and thought, 
do you know who I am? I'm an American pilot. Like, you're shooting at me. Like, the, this, this reality of the ground suddenly was this new world. So, um, the reason I bring up this uh, idea of failure is not because I judge anything that you went through or the choices you made as failure at all. What I am looking into is the, the Vietnamese set about with a systematic um, purpose of humiliating you. They knew that if they could give you, get you to give more than name, rank, and serial number, they could get inside of your consciousness, your feeling of pride in who you were. And one of the things that future leaders need to discover is who they are beyond failure, when they deem they have failed. And the Vietnam War experience tested our ideas of ourselves. They tested individually your idea of yourself. You went in believing you could give name, rank, and serial number only, and you had to learn something else. What I'd love to do is, every former POW tells this story of being beaten down, being tortured, being left in that abject misery of feeling like they had failed. And then that first redemptive moment when another human soul or someone gets to you and says, we're brothers and best, we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me please about that experience for you? When Mine. Well, to begin with, I, I think our knowledge of what the war was all about was pretty rudimentary. And uh, so we were just there to do our job, from my level anyway. I know, you know, if you were a commander, you probably had a lot more knowledge and a lot more um, maybe motivation. I don't know, but we were just there doing a job, a patriotic. We were told that... Uh, the North was inv invading the South, and uh, they were communist, and we were there to defeat communism and protect our friends in South Vietnam, and that, and that was it, you know. And I had been to Sears School, and had been, it had been hammered into us, you know, name, rank, service number, and date of birth, nothing else. And I remember one time, uh, they they called a halt to the problem and they laid me out on a table and they said, you have a sucking chest wound. Restart the program. And so the interrogator there said, you know, you, you need an immediate blood transfusion. What's your blood type? I said, A positive. Because it's on my dog tags, it was on my ID card. I wanted them to know that as soon as possible. And I was criticized for that because it was something beyond Navy rank, service number, date of birth. You'll be willing to die rather than give anything else other than that. That was the training. That's how I went into this experience. And of course, we found out that that was not possible. You can't, you can't survive, you know, without communicating with your captors about. They ask you whether you're hungry, you like the food or whatever. You're not going to tell them name, rank, service, number, and date of birth. But any information we tried, you know, to, to not give them. Over time, they, they learned some things about me uh, through two things. Somebody must have sent them a newspaper clipping about my memorial service because they knew things about Davidson College and all this, they only could have gotten it from that. So that blew a lot of cover. And uh, then they, uh, one day in interrogation, they brought in my flight gear and they undid the Mark 3C, which is the flotation device. We had taken off every, everything on our uniforms, our helmet, our everything. Uh, that identified us as members of uh, VF-84 or anything to do with USS Independence or an F-4 or anything. We were, you know, kind of just blank, tried to be. Cut off every identification off the end of cards and maps and everything. I didn't wear a wedding ring. I didn't, you know, carry a wallet other than my Geneva 
ID card, military ID card. That was it. Well, they, they showed me this uh, Mark III C, and on the inside, where I couldn't see it, was marked VF-84 because it was maintained by the ship, not by the squadron. So that blew <laughs> my cover there. Um, but still, I, you know, I, I denied uh, that I was, uh, denied that I was married. I, you know, I, I, I just stuck to the AMRAC service number and date of birth as much as I could. And then finally, when it came time, they changed their policy and they decided they were going to get uh, what they wanted, documents, you know, a, a list of uh, missions that you had flown, a biography, an autobiography, a confession and apology to the Vietnamese people. That's what they wanted. And uh, I wasn't going to... I wasn't going to give them that. So when I was tortured for the first time, and I had endured a lot of beatings and a lot of discomfort, you know, spent several days um, holding up the wall and kneeling down and without sleep and water and food, all this kind of stuff. And I thought, well, I'm pretty tough, you know, and they're not going to torture me to do these things to write these things. And then when I, when I, I took it as long as I possibly could, and I finally had to say, I give. It was the most devastating moment of my life, just about. And the only, the only thing that saved me and probably most everyone else, because was the fact that the method of torture that they used rendered your hands and arms practically useless. And so you couldn't physically write what they wanted you to write. And so when it came time to, to write, when you could, um, it had been enough time that you recover a little bit, you know, and you say, okay, how, how am I gonna, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to not do what they want, not give them the information that they want, and yet r not refuse again? Because you know they're going to torture you again, and you know the end result. And so in that intervening time, you come up with uh, cover stories. You include what they already know and deny what they don't know. And so in terms of military um, uh, missions, I said, well, I'd flown five, four missions and, you know, they were photo reconnaissance and I didn't drop any bombs or anything like that. Um, and so the, the, the other things that I wrote all had things in them that really would have not done exactly what they wanted to do. And anybody reading them uh, would would realize that the Vietnamese didn't realize that, and that what they did, they would make you, you'd write it, they'd bring it back, and they say this is not good, and you write it again. What they hoped that you would write more of the truth. We figured out though that the, that wasn't the thing. It was just you could write something even worse, and it would pass. They just wanted you to write it over and over again hoping that you would do more. And so you finally figured out, you keep writing it, you write less, or you put more kind of bombs in there. So we learned these techniques, but it did not uh, lessen the uh, impact of the fact that you'd been broken and you thought you'd never be broken. And the psychological um, damage of that lasted longer than the physical. And it took a, quite a while for you to recover physically from this. They didn't really leave scars, but they certainly um, left a mental scar. And uh, it was only when uh, I got back into the sort of calm network, we were out at the briar patch when this happened, and the only person I could talk to was Howie Dunn, one guy. 
and we shared all of our experience. And he, it, same thing happened to him. I mean, he's a, he was a Marine, you know, F-4 pilot. And uh, we had gone, we had reacted pretty much the same way. But it was not until I got back into the ComNet when we moved back to, to Hanoi that I realized that Stockdale, Denton, Reisner, all the people that I looked up to as our greatest, toughest leaders had been through the same thing and had reacted pretty much the same way that I had. And uh, some of the advice that, you know, Reisner and Stockdale had passed on before, you know, they said, we all, you know, we all make mistakes, we all have weaknesses, and you need to forgive each other for those. And you also need to forgive yourself. So that was uh, the healing and the kind of um, realization that even though we're not as tough as we thought, we can't resist, you know, to the point. And everybody, I think, particularly Stockdale, Denton, Reisner, and so on, realized that if you, if you hold out for as long as you can, by definition, you have no further will to resist, by definition, because you've taken it as far as you can. There was also the recognition that uh, in the intervening time between the time that you say that you'll do whatever it is and, and they, you're physically able to do it, you recover some of that resistance, the will to resist. And you can come up with, you know, ways of not doing exactly what they want. And they didn't want you just to sign a document that they had written because they wanted you to write it. And so that gave you an advantage. And so the guidance there was that uh, you will accept torture, you know, to, to uh, avoid giving this kind of information or doing what it is that they want you to do. Uh, but when you realize that they are gonna torture you till they get it, give up early. With the idea that if you give up early, then you will have, uh, you will have that will to resist and you won't be afraid to lie to them and to continue to resist at a second level. And so that became the second line of resistance. And that's what, that's what allowed us to be tortured in the future and yet to, to deal with it in, in some effective way. And that was the wonderful guidance of, of our senior leaders. And I think we all uh, benefited from that. And that became sort of the official guidance that you accept torture, but give up early. Don't, don't sacrifice your, you know, your long-term health over something like this and uh, so on. So you come to, uh, to realize that you are not tough as you are, as you thought you were, but you are, you have skills you did not realize you had, and you can do things that you didn't realize you could do. This is such a powerful and beautiful thing to, there's so many ways that all of you came together, but you all started with the same place which was you encountered what you saw as your personal failure. Yeah. And you were all warriors. You had a code, the, you, you followed the code of a warrior, which is to cover your family's back and he will cover yours. Mm. That was fundamental. Right. But then in addition to that was this code and ethic of an American warrior, of someone who is in the American military, following this, this code of conduct. Mm -hmm. And you were, the code of conduct without you knowing it designed the possibility of you failing. It, it, pre, uh, it predetermined that you were invincible, that you were invulnerable, and that's not reality. So mm -hmm. in the conditions on the ground, all of you had to find your way together to a new place where, whoops, just lost the light. 
let's cut for a moment. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. We lost that one. We'll let you, uh, um, before you step away, you're, you're tethered to a... Oh, okay. Unplug you. No, that's all right. I just want to stand up. Yes. My knees are... Let me cut. 